Welcome to this lecture in the Phase 4 series. Today we're going to talk about semi-solids, or in particular, how we measure the flow of semi-solids, which is called rheology. Now, before we start, I recognise that you don't know who I am, so let me introduce myself. My name is Simon, and I'm a professor of pharmaceutics right here at the school. We don't have many lectures this year, but we do have a lot of lectures next year. But what I normally say at the start of lectures is, if you don't have one already, go and get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. And when you've done that, come back and let's make a start. So, since this is our first lecture, how is the lecture going to work? Very clearly, I am recording the lecture so that you can see me deliver the lecture as if we were in a lecture theatre, and that's great. But you also need to look at the PowerPoint slides. So you should have the PowerPoint slides from the Moodle page. So what I recommend is that you have the PowerPoint slides open and you watch the video alongside the PowerPoint slides. When I want you to change to a different slide, I will put the slide on the screen of the video so you know you should be looking at that particular slide as we go through the class. OK, so with that in mind, on the screen in front of you are the learning objectives from today's lecture. These are the things that you should be able to do. Not by the end of the lecture, but once you've started reading around the subject and before the exam, these are the things you should be able to know. So firstly, why? Why do we worry about the rheological properties in the first place? And how do they affect the performance of some drug products? We're going to look at which drug products we might be considering later on. But clearly, I think you might imagine we're talking about creams and liquids, not tablets and capsules, because they tend to be much more solid. You should be able to recognise, discuss and give examples of pharmaceutical materials that exhibit certain rheological properties. So there are four that we're going to consider by the end of this video. Newtonian behaviour is one and the other three are classified as non-Newtonian because they are not Newtonian. Yes. So those three would be plastic, pseudoplastic and dilatant. So. What that means is, imagine that uh, you are thinking, what do I need to revise for the exam, sir? The answer is, you should be able to know those four types of rheological behaviour and give examples of materials that behave that way. Or maybe another way around is I could say to you, what, um, what does the rheological behaviour of a dilatant material look like? So you should either be able to look at rheological data and interpret what type of behaviour it is and what it applies to, or conversely, I can give you an example of a material and you could draw its rheological behaviour. Yeah? So it goes both ways. And the last thing, and it's a tricky concept we're going to come to right at the end of the video, is that some materials exhibit time dependent phenomena. So what that means is you apply a force to a material and you get it to flow or something like that. But when you remove that force, the material doesn't respond instantly. In other words, you change a material by applying a force to it. And so there's a time dependency there, and that has an effect on rheological behaviour as well. So uh, in summary, four types of rheological behaviour, some of those exhibit time dependency. So you should be able to look at data and interpret the data, or talk about a product and tell me what the data look like. Before we start getting technical, uh, one question students often ask is, is rheology an easy subject, sir? And the answer is, it most definitely is not. On the screen in front of you is an example from a textbook. It's from An Introduction to Rheology by Barnes, Hutton and Waters, a tremendous book. So I have just copied you section 1.5, which reads, Rheology is a difficult subject. And if you read the paragraph below, you can see why it's a difficult subject. So under no circumstances do I want you to think that if you don't understand everything by the end of the lecture, you are in some way a failure because you're not. This is a really difficult subject. And I think it's kind of important to go over the material several times just so that you, you get the basics in your head. And I'm not asking you to be a rheology expert. I'm just asking you to have a basic appreciation of how some materials flow and why rheological properties are important for some materials rather than others. Now, you will know that after lectures, students often talk online, share experiences about what they thought about the lecture. And every now and again, uh, the students come up with something that I find even funnier than what I try and come up with. And so on the screen in front of you is an example from a textbook that one of the students found after the lecture a few years ago. And you can see it's a quick guide to rheology. What is rheology? Most people are familiar with the basics of rheology from experience with diarrhoea. That's not pleasant, but 
the bottom line is that um, diarrhea uh, is in fact an example of a very interesting material with interesting rheological properties. But we are not going to focus on the rheological properties of diarrhea in this class. You will be pleased to know. Let's start with some basic definitions. And the most basic definition we can start with is what is rheology in the first place? And the answer is it is the deformation and flow of matter. What does that mean in real world terms? It means we apply a force to a material. Let's say we push it and we see how fast that material flows in response. I said earlier it would be a good idea to have a cup of tea or coffee. So um, here is mine. Imagine I were to spill the coffee onto the table, which obviously I won't. It would be a waste of very good um, coffee. But imagine that you had coffee on the surface of a table and you were to apply some force to that coffee with your fingers. What would happen? The liquid would flow away, wouldn't it? It would flow very fast if you try and push it. Imagine that you had the mug full of coffee and that was sat on the table and you tried to push the mug. The mug itself is not going to deform at all, really. You might be able to slide it across the table, but the mug is not going to deform. So when you apply a force to the mug, it resists the force that you're applying a lot more. And in fact, it probably won't ever flow. If you apply enough force, you'll break the, you'll break the mug, but it won't actually flow. So what that means is different materials flow at different rates when you apply a force to them. And how easily or hard they flow is termed the viscosity. So viscosity is technically resistance to flow. The more resistant a material is to move when you apply a force to it, the higher the viscosity. So viscosity is kind of key here. When we look at some of the behaviours that are coming up, in all cases, what we do is apply a force to a material and we measure how fast it flows as a response to that force. And from those bits of information, we determine the viscosity. So viscosity is key and it means resistance to flow. Higher viscosity, harder it is for a material to flow. Does this matter from a pharmaceutical perspective? I hear you ask. And clearly, the answer is yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be spending all this time talking through this video explaining what rheological properties are. It matters because imagine you worked in a large pharmaceutical company and you're moving tons of material around a factory from one processing stage to another. It does matter enormously how that material is going to flow. It needs to flow in a very predictable way, for instance. It also matters for drug products. So if you go into your local pharmacy and you look at the range of products that are available, some of those products are critically uh, dependent upon how they behave when you apply force to them. And you might not have thought of that. So on the screen in front of you are some classic examples of products where rheological properties are really important to their use. If I start at the top right of the screen uh, with a cream, tube of cream, I think you might have guessed that that's probably the most important for rheological properties. Here is a tube of cream. It's a tube of um, Savlon. Uh, can you imagine someone cuts themselves? Imagine I've cut my finger and I don't want to get a raging infection. So I'm going to slather it in Savlon because that's what my mum used to tell me to do when I was a, a child. So the first thing I'm going to do, assuming I'm not in shock uh, from, from the cut, is I'm going to take the lid off the tube. So let's do that. So there's no lid on my tube of cream right now. The cream is not flowing spontaneously from the tube to the table. Imagine that this um, tube was filled with a water-based uh, solution or suspension and you took the lid off, that, that liquid's going to fall right out because it's got a very low viscosity. There's not really anything stopping it flowing. But the viscosity of a cream is a lot higher and so it won't spontaneously leave the tube and that's what we want. On the other hand, and this is my other hand, uh, we do want the cream onto this um, cut because obviously we, we can't get any um, action or get better if we don't apply the cream. So I'm going to apply a force to the tube and in applying a force the, uh, the cream is going to move. So I apply the force by squeezing the tube and the cream has moved onto my finger. Let's put the lid back on and that's good because that's where I need it. Again, imagine that this was a lotion or something like that. A lotion is um, is very liquid like and it's going to run off my finger, whereas a cream is much more uh, rigid and so it won't fall off as I shake my hand around. That's what we want. We want it to stay in place. But equally, 
if we haven't covered the entire cut or it's um, a moisturizing cream or something like that we want to be able to mix it into the skin by applying a force so let me apply a force to that and then you can see that I can move the cream all over my skin okay one consequence of this is that if I had had a cut I now should get better another consequence is I've got a hand which is covered in uh, savlon which is not quite so good so I need to get rid of that before we carry on but I hope you can see that the point here especially for a cream is that you don't want it to move spontaneously but you do want it to move when the consumer wants to move it and so it needs the right balance of rheological properties to make sure that happens on the top um, right of the screen is magnesium trisilicate mixture that is a suspension so suspensions are particles suspended in water and again I think you might imagine that if you were to let that sit and the particles settle at the bottom you're effectively dealing with the rheological properties of water because that's what's left behind but when you shake that and you disperse those particles the rheological properties are probably going to change somewhat um, after the first tea break we're going to focus on suspensions for a little bit so don't worry about that right now and then at the bottom of the screen you've got another example which is lip balm so it's the same deal I think you can imagine if you took the top off a lip balm you don't want it running all over the table but when you apply it to your lips you do want it to to flow onto your lips and also you don't really want something sitting on your lips which is really hard and rigid because it's going to feel really horrible isn't it so as you then uh, talk once you've applied the lip balm the lip balm should move with your skin so uh, rheological properties is kind of important how do we define what types of materials we can actually look at clearly there's a huge range of materials in the world uh, ranging from uh, simple liquids like a cup of coffee to really solid materials like the table that I'm currently sitting at right so the answer is that true solid materials those are called elastic materials and when they hit each other uh, they bounce off each other in elastic fashion uh, those are true Hookean solids and they lie at one end of the spectrum of materials we might look at and then a liquid if it's a if it's a true um, Newtonian liquid is at the far end of uh, the other end of the um, spectrum of materials that we look at I'm going to define what a Newtonian fluid is in just a minute so don't panic about it right now it's simply to note that true solids are hooky and solids and they lie at one extreme and true liquids are Newtonian fluids and they lie at the other end of the extreme and in between those two materials have a degree of properties of both a material can be a bit liquid like and it can be a bit solid like so it's a bit difficult to say is this material a solid or a liquid because it's got the properties of both and we call those materials semi-solid okay or uh, viscoelastic is another term because it's a mixture of a viscous property with an elastic property yeah and um, can we measure any material which is a semi-solid we can but we can't really measure them with rheology unless they're more liquid like than solid like okay so if you think about what I've said already um, I'm saying that we apply a force to a material and we measure how it flows if the material is towards the liquid end of our semi-solid spectrum the material is probably going to flow and we can measure that if it lies more towards the solid end of this spectrum we can apply some force but it's not really going to move very much and so um, the types of rheology we're going to talk about don't really apply to more solid materials we're really looking at the more liquid end of the spectrum so that's just one to remember and the other one is we do need a couple of technical terms that we're going to use throughout the rest of the lecture now I've said this already we are applying a force to a material and we're measuring how it flows in response the technical term for that is we're applying a shear shear as in s-h-e-a-r not s-h-e-e-r which is a completely different type of shear as often in the English language uh, many words have multiple meanings and shear is one of them so you can experience shear terror for instance probably right before you have to sit this exam but um, we're talking about shear s-h-e-a-r shear stress so when we apply a force to a material it's called a shear stress okay when the material flows it's called a shear rate because it's flowing in response to the, uh, the shear stress that we've applied so shear stress and shear rate they're really important terms as we go through the lecture on the screen is a pink box with a number of different pharmaceutical products arranged in it liquids at the bottom solids at the top lotions creams ointments pastes and 
powders. They are arranged in this order for a reason, and the reason is because they are becoming increasingly viscous as you go up the table. So the types of pharmaceuticals with the um, lowest viscosity would be lotions and liniments. They would be typically ethanol or ethanol water mixtures. I think you can imagine they would run off your skin very fast. So they have very low viscosities. Then we have creams, which are typically oil and water emulsions. Don't have to be, but they are usually. Ointments, um, becoming a little bit um, thicker and more oily. The oil phase is, is increasing in an ointment. Pastes are really wet solids. <laughs> so imagine that you've wet granulated something. You've got quite a high water content. Chances are that's more of a paste. And then right at the top, you've got powders. And powders are not the sort of thing we're going to talk about um, in this lecture. So just to give you an example of the types of pharmaceutical materials and where they rank in terms of their viscosity. So we're going to start with Newtonian fluids and we're going to look at Newtonian fluids and then we're going to have a tea break. You'll be pleased to know. OK, so Newtonian fluids are the easiest to describe and they follow Newton's law. Unsurprisingly, if you don't know what Newton's law is, it's written in the pink box. The rate of flow, so the shear rate, is directly proportional to the applied stress or the shear stress. So I said this already. In all of these measurements, we are applying a force to a material, which is the shear stress. And we're measuring how the material flows in response, which is the shear rate. Uh, sometimes I write shear stress and shear rate on a graph. Sometimes to save time, I use uh, a symbol to abbreviate for shear rate and shear stress. And so the symbols are shown on the screen, they're um, Greek letters. So for shear rate, um, it's uh, gamma and for shear stress, it's uh, sigma. OK, so sometimes you'll see those written down instead. So I just want you to remember sh um, shear rate, shear stress. Shear stress is the easiest because um, sigma is S in the Greek language, isn't it? So shear stress has got a symbol, uh, a sigma symbol, and a shear rate has the gamma symbol. So sometimes you see those written on uh, my graphs. The units of... Um, of flow are kind of important. And the question is, where do these units come from? Uh, and the answer is, you have to think about what happens to a material when you apply a force to it. So on the screen in front of you is a thing called a hypothetical cube. That's the diagram that's shown on the top, which is a little bit complicated, but it's just meant to be, meant to be um, a visual representation of how a material moves when you apply a force to it. And it allows you to understand where the units of some of these things come from. So a hypothetical cube essentially imagines that the material you're applying a force to can be split into horizontal layers. And then it assumes that you are applying a force evenly to the top layer only. So imagine that you had a cube of water, if you can imagine such a thing, and you applied a force to that water, and you're applying that force only by putting your hand on the top surface of the water and then moving forward. That's what a hypothetical cube uh, is imagining. I find it somewhat easier to think about a packet of playing cards. So I just happen to have a packet of playing cards right here. That was handy, wasn't it? And I think you can imagine that. This is a bit like a cube, but it's been split into horizontal layers because each card is one layer in my deck, isn't it? So imagine what would happen if I had this packet of playing cards. It starts like this and I apply a force to the material, I'm going to apply a force only to the top card by putting my hand on the top card and moving forward. If I do that, by the time I've finished, the deck of cards has changed a little bit. It looks, it looks a little bit like the diagram, I hope you can see. So what's happened here is that the force has been applied to my top layer, and so it's moved the furthest, because that's the, the layer on which the force is being directly applied. But the card below it, so the next layer down, it's also moving, it's moving by friction. So the top card moves the most, but in moving forward, it drags the card below it. So the second card moves almost as far as the top card. And then the third card is dragged by the second card, the fourth by the third and so on. Each card, as we go down this deck, is being dragged forward slightly less than the card above it. And so we, we start with something which is um, a cube on my diagram, and we end up with a displaced cube like this as we've applied a force to it. When we want to calculate what's going on here then, for instance, we can calculate the rate of flow, which is how fast the material is moving, and that's going to be given by the velocity of the top layer, which is in meters per second, divided by 
uh, the height of the cube in meters. And so that gives us a rate of flow in seconds to the minus one. Meters per second divided by meters is seconds to the minus one. And that is our shear rate. On the other hand, the applied stress, the shear stress, is given by the amount of force that we're applying, which is uh, in newtons to the surface, multiplied by the area of the top layer, which is in meters squared. So we end up with a force, a, a shear stress, which has the units of newtons per meter squared. I say this only because when we start looking at these graphs later on, um, we have some of these units in place, and I just want you to be aware of where they come from. So rate of flow has units of seconds to the minus one, and shear stress has units of newtons per meter squared. I've said a couple of times already in this lecture that viscosity is really important. It's the key thing that we want to understand. Well, it, it's one thing we want to understand. We also want to understand how viscosity changes in response to applied stress, but we're going to come back to that in part three. So don't panic for that right now. The question is, how do we calculate the viscosity of a material? All, all we seem to be doing is applying a stress and measuring a rate. Okay. The answer is, as in many instances, we plot a graph. And the reason we plot a graph is it's a lot easier to see a trend in data when, a, when data are plotted than if we have a table of data. Imagine, for instance, I have a material and I apply a certain amount of stress to it and I measure the rate. I could put that as one line in a table. Then I apply a different amount of stress and measure the rate. I could have that as a second line in a table. I could create a really big table of numbers. But it's really difficult to interpret a table of numbers because you can't see the trend. It's much easier to plot the data because that allows you to look at how those data are changing visually and you can start to see some interesting trends. So the definition for a Newtonian fluid is that the uh, shear rate is directly proportional to the applied shear stress. Directly proportional means if I double the shear stress, I double the shear rate. If I triple the shear stress, I triple the shear rate and so on. And the consequence of that is if I plot a graph of shear stress on the y-axis versus shear uh, rate on the x-axis, I'm going to end up with a straight line as shown on the screen in front of you. So remember sigma and gamma, so shear stress on the y-axis, shear rate on the x-axis, I end up with oh, a straight line like this, okay? Because everything is directly proportional. So if an exam question said, what is the definition of a Newtonian fluid you could say a Newtonian fluid is one where the applied shear uh, stress is directly proportional to the shear rate. Another way is you could say if I plotted a graph of shear stress versus shear rate, I'd get a straight line. And there is a third way to, to define it, and that is to say where well, the viscosity of a Newtonian fluid is always constant. Why is it always constant? I hear you ask. And the answer is because viscosity is calculated as the gradient of the shear stress versus shear rate uh, plot. So if the shear stress versus shear rate plot is linear, which it is in this case, it doesn't matter where I calculate the gradient of that line, it's always going to give me the same number. Okay. Um, viscosity is also given a Greek symbol, eta, in this case, so you can see that on the right-hand side of the, of the screen. So viscosity on the y-axis, um, uh, shear rate on the um, x-axis and it will be constant because it doesn't matter where I calculate the, the gradient I'm always going to get the same number so I'm going to get a constant um, viscosity and that means that the units of viscosity are going to be newtons per second per meter at uh, newtons per second per meter squared because they're, they're the two units for um, shear stress and shear rate divided by each other and that also has a special uh, name pascal seconds it can be converted to okay so in this instance, for a Newtonian fluid, the viscosity is always constant. So in an exam, I've said this already, I know, in an exam, I often ask to start with as, as your warm-up question, what is a Newtonian fluid? The answer is, it's a material that shear rate is directly proportional to applied shear stress, or it's a material whose viscosity is always constant, irrespective of the applied shear stress. It's kind of important to remember that, because most people forget that definition, that the viscosity is constant, they just go for... Um, the first definition. Right, you'll be pleased to know we're going to stop for a tea break and when we come back we're going to look at suspensions. So go make yourself another cup of tea or coffee and I'll see you in a bit. <laughs>